This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. Now that more than 30% of folks in the US are fully vaccinated and businesses are reopening, it's probably a good time to start brainstorming new excuses to get out of doing stuff. Anyway, here's what we got for y'all. Tonight, the human impact of President Biden's decision to lift the limit on refugees accepted into the US, a limit put in place by the Trump White House. Then we learn more about the nerve agent identified in the poisoning of Vladimir Putin's most prominent Russian critic. But first, here's what you need to know right now. The president laid out a new vaccine target today. Our goal by July 4th is to have 70% of adult Americans at least one shot and 160 million Americans fully vaccinated. Across the US, COVID cases are dropping and states are reopening. Today, Chicago became the latest city to update its plan to drop restrictions on gatherings and return to normalcy, eyeing July 4th as a full reopening date. Every day that our COVID-19 metrics continue to tick downward brings us a day closer uh, to being able to put this pandemic in the rearview mirror. New York and New Jersey announced plans to fully reopen later this month. Capacity restrictions in both states are set to expire in a couple of weeks. New York's 24-7 subway service is also set to make a return. To try and incentivize more people to get the vaccine, New Jersey created a shot and a beer program your COVID-19 shot record will get you a free beer at participating breweries this month. But as the US gets a glimpse of at least something closer to normalcy, other parts of the world are in full-blown crisis mode. Due to the devastating surge in India, the Biden administration suspended most travel to and from there. The travel ban officially went into effect today. India's health ministry says the country reported more than 350,000 new cases and nearly 3,500 deaths in just 24 hours. Health experts believe believe things are still going to get worse since they believe the country hasn't even reached the peak of the second wave yet. The thing is, it's not just India. Evidence shows other developing countries are facing a fierce new wave that includes Laos and Thailand. The increase is mainly tied to the more contagious COVID variants, but a slow vaccine rollout has also hurt progress. The Food and Drug Administration could authorize the Pfizer vaccine for adolescents in the U.S. as early as next week. It's welcome news for many families with 12 to 15 year olds. The vaccine expansion would mark a significant development in the country's vaccine rollout, especially as daily shots have been slowly dropping. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, children currently account for 22.4% of all new COVID cases in the U.S. One year ago, kids made up just 3%. Health experts say there's a lot of factors that could be impacting that, including less risk among many adults vaccinated, COVID variants, and a loosening of restrictions, especially around school activities. Pfizer released the preliminary results of its adolescent study back in March, showing there wasn't a single COVID case among the kids who were fully vaccinated. Moderna expects results soon from its own clinical trial involving kids ages 12 to 17. Both Pfizer and Moderna have already started trials for younger kids and infants. Those results are expected later this year. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration released its official calculations for the average temperature of the country, and it's pretty hot. The 30-year average temperature for the lower 48 states climbed to a record high of 53.3 degrees Fahrenheit. That's one degree hotter than the average just 20 years ago. It's also expected to get wetter in the eastern and central parts of the nation while getting considerably drier in the west. Since 1930, this data has been released every decade, so nine times total. All but two of those releases have shown average temps warming up. Yesterday, President Biden raised the cap on admitting refugees in the U.S. to more than 62,000 for the next six months. While this is welcome news to refugees and immigration advocates, Biden hesitated on raising that cap back in March, which put some refugees in a precarious situation and unable to travel to the states. Newsy's Ben Shimiso spoke to a Congolese refugee living in Memphis, Tennessee, about his hopes for reuniting with his wife very soon. It was a bad, bad, bad situation. It was something that I didn't expect. Over the past couple months, Congolese refugee Joseph Madogo went through a roller coaster of emotions due to President Biden's about face on refugee admission numbers. Madogo, who resettled to the U.S. five years ago and lives in Tennessee, was expecting his wife to arrive in Memphis on March 9th from a Burundi refugee camp. I, I prepared some gift for her, flowers, whatever. everything was a uh, terror. 
Diane Tosi had been cleared by the U.S. government for resettlement, but her flight was cancelled at the last minute because of President Biden's delay in fulfilling his pledge to raise the refugee cap. As a man, I couldn't just cry like a baby, but inside me, it was very, very, very painful. Both Madogo and Tosi have spent years in African refugee camps after fleeing war in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. They are childhood friends who got married right before the pandemic. President Biden's delay initially turned into a broken promise as the White House announced in April it was keeping the Trump administration's record low refugee ceiling at 15,000. Facing a backlash, the president reversed himself on Monday by more than quadrupling the cap to 62,500 refugees for the next six months. But he acknowledged the U.S. is unlikely to hit that mark. Critics say his reversal is a bow to the left and a distraction from the border crisis. But advocates rejoiced. It sends a clear signal to the world that we are back. Former Homeland Security official Elizabeth Newman says admitting more refugees will give the U.S. more credibility on the world stage and will reduce the risk that displaced people in refugee camps become radicalized. We can reduce that vulnerability if we just speed up the system. It doesn't take, it shouldn't take 10 years to resolve a case. As for Madogo, he's once more hopeful he'll soon reunite with his wife. I'm so excited. I can't wait to meet my wife. President Biden, I said thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Ben Shamiso, Newsy. When you're back, we'll wade through all the bantha fodder to tell you what's trending. We here at ITL are friends of the force. I woke up with this tingly little midichlorian feeling all around me today. Since we all hear a lot about May the 4th these days, I'll try to hit this first one in less time than it took Han to do the Kessel Run. And yeah, I know a parsec is a unit of length, not time. Yes, Star Wars fans, it's that time again. Then man your ships and may the force be with you. There's perhaps no other franchise that can ring an entire holiday out of one iconic line of dialogue. May 4th or may the 4th be with you has been the unofficial Star Wars day for decades, celebrated by fans and the franchise alike. These days, it's got some corporate promotional backing. This year's Star Wars day features the premiere of a new animated series, The Bad Batch on Disney+, Plus, which follows a group of renegade clone soldiers in the aftermath of the Clone Wars. It's kind of a follow-up to the well-liked Clone Wars series, which was done by the same studio. Disney is also drawing on its broader portfolio to celebrate Star Wars Day. The Simpsons is releasing a short crossover episode, and ESPN broadcasters are being forced to dress up like Star Wars characters for tonight's Astros-Yankees game. Leave it to Disney to take cross-promotion to its fullest potential. News of the split between Microsoft founder Bill Gates and philanthropist Melinda Gates has sparked a lot of social media speculation about what the divorce will mean for the couple and for their sizable fortune. Bill and Melinda Gates run one of the largest charity foundations in the world, and Bill Gates is still one of the world's richest people at a whopping $130 billion. The couple said they'd continue to work together at their foundation, but haven't offered any details yet. Billionaire divorces can involve eye-watering sums of money. The 2019 divorce between Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos and Mackenzie Scott gave Scott $38 billion, including a 4% stake in Amazon. Scott has since donated over $6 billion of her personal wealth to charity. With all that's going on in the world right now, it's important to take a step back and enjoy the little pleasures of life. Like this photo of President Biden visiting former President Jimmy Carter. The Carter Foundation released this image of the first couple visiting the Carters and, well, it raises so many questions. Why is Biden towering over Rosalind Carter? Why does Jimmy Carter's head look so much smaller than Jill Biden's? Did Peter Jackson set this shot up? What's going on here? Some quick research confirms that although the six foot tall Biden has a few inches on the Carters, the weird photo is probably due to lighting and camera angle oddities rather than late onset gigantism. Biden and Carter actually go back a ways. Then Senator Biden was among the first to endorse Carter for his successful presidential bid in 1976. Last week, Alexei Navalny, an imprisoned opposition leader and vocal critic of Russian President Vladimir Putin, ended a 24-day hunger strike 
that left him in failing health. But chemical weapons experts say the nerve agent used on Navalny could still be impacting his health. Newsy Sasha Ingbert has more. Vladimir Putin's most prominent critic is slowly starting to eat again after a 24-day hunger strike in prison. Experts say the Kremlin not only holds the keys to Alexei Navalny's freedom, but to knowledge of health problems he still faces from being poisoned. We don't have a lot of experience with this in people. Some doctors say the dissident is likely experiencing long-term effects from exposure to Novichok nerve agent last year. And at a prison east of Moscow months later, the 44-year-old said he was denied adequate health care. So began a dangerous hunger strike. He need neurologists to look at some of the neurologic effects. He needs psychologists and psychiatrists to talk about some of the psychological effects. There's not one type of doctor that's going to be able to solve all of these problems. Novichok hinders an enzyme that regulates the nervous system's ability to send signals. But most researchers know little about Novichok, a Russian word meaning newcomer, for when this class of nerve agents was invented. With poisoning so rare, understanding largely comes from different but related substances, including accidental overdoses of pesticides and a sarin attack on a Tokyo subway in the 90s. Researchers believe the physical and psychological effects include numbness, chronic fatigue, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Some of Navalny's complaints, like hand numbness, appear to coincide. But a chemical weapons specialist tells Newsy Russian authorities already know about Navalny's ailments. It's Russian intellectual property. They, they have all the secret files on this. In the 70s and 1980s, when these things were being developed in the Soviet Union, the safety record of this program was particularly appalling. There is no doubt in my mind they had numerous accidental poisonings and exposures to these chemicals. Our partners at the investigative group Bellingcat discovered a poison squad that appears to work with a scientist from that early program. This secret group, part of a successor to the Soviet Union's KGB, is blamed for the attack on Navalny, though the Kremlin denies Russia's hand. Something with an obvious trail that leads obviously back to Moscow and St. Petersburg makes me wonder, is lethality necessarily the end state? Perhaps long-term disability uh, is as bad a punishment for somebody who's a perceived enemy of the state as just killing them outright. Russian doctors initially treated Navalny, saying they found no trace of nerve agent. Eventually, he was flown to Germany for more care. But in January, he returned and was arrested in Moscow. He's serving a two and a half year prison sentence. His recent appeal rejected. Navalny wanted to be with his people. This is what he always uh, said to me. I'm pretty sure that he fully realized what's gonna happen. From Washington, Sasha Ingber, Newsy. Some parts of California saw a designation this week that hasn't happened in seven years. The National Weather Service issued a red flag warning for parts of California this week, which is the first time it's happened this early in the year since 2014. It's a sign of dangerous fire conditions that could lead to the kind of devastating wildfires seen across the Western US. They're so deadly that they can send smoke all the way over to Europe. As National Reporter Stephanie Stone tells us, wildfires can impact the air quality for the entire continent. These are satellite images from NASA. It shows the smoke thousands of miles from the fire. That red you see? NASA describes that as aerosols, a combination of particles which carry bad things into the air and into your lungs. All the things that are burning, trees, grass, brush, homes, turned into soot and absorbed by us. With this pollution, nobody knows how badly it will get affected, but if we extrapolate the data from our previous uh, air quality, it's not good. I think the long-term side effect we will see many, many years down the line. Dr. Malik Baz is the medical director for Baz Allergy and Sinus Center in Central California. They've got 13 locations and all of them are busy, as Central California is essentially a big bowl, surrounded by mountains which trap pollution over the valley. Air quality is always an issue for this part of the state, and fires 
multiply the problem. People who have got a respiratory problem, whether allergy, asthma, sinus problem, uh, any time the air quality goes bad, they get their symptoms get worse and that affects them. But with this air quality, it doesn't matter whether you've got any respiratory problems or not. Everybody's getting affected. It's bad in other Western cities, too. This is really an unprecedented uh, wildfire season that we're, that we're having here in, in 2020. We have fires across most of the states in the Western United States, especially in Washington, Oregon, California. Um, the Seattle area of Portland, I think Portland has some of the worst air quality in the, in the world right now, which is pretty shocking because normally they have pretty good air quality. John Claussen is the director of air quality science and planning for San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution and Control District. It's his job to monitor and improve air quality and help reduce emissions. Those sorts of emissions can come off of wildfires or different industrial sources, um, the, the burning of different material. And the challenge with that and the health challenges is because it's so small, it can get deep inside of your lungs. It can get into your bloodstream, cause damage to inter internal organs. A good air quality is anywhere from zero to 50. Some of the cities next to the fires are seeing numbers in the four and five hundreds. California, Claussen says, has had fires burn 3.4 million acres. That's larger than the state of Connecticut as a whole. And that smoke from the west isn't just staying local. Just that enormous amount of emissions that are going up into the atmosphere, they can get caught up in transport flow from the from the um, Pacific Ocean over to the Atlantic. So it can, it can slowly kind of cross over the continent and, and be able to, to reach different areas of the country, which is what we're trying, what we're starting to observe right now. Which means they say use the see and smell rule and watch the air quality index wherever you are. Sometimes that air can make you feel bad and doctors advise you watch your symptoms. Coughing, wheezing, difficulty breathing, uh, irritation of your eyeballs, sneezing, itching, nasal congestion, headaches. Dr. Boz says these are also the symptoms of COVID, which makes some problems hard to diagnose. If your air quality isn't good, he suggests staying in, avoiding strenuous exercise outside, changing the filters in your home and car, and keeping up on your medications and hydration. And while fires aren't forever, we are unfortunately just starting a season that's shaping up to be unprecedented, just like 2020. The concern here is we are kind of in the middle of wildfire season. Uh, the past few years, wildfire season has ended more in the month of November. And so here we are in September, we could have a couple months left to go with these fires. I'm Stephanie Stone reporting. If you haven't done so already, feel free to holler at us on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. And hollering is just an expression, okay? If you start sending me messages in all caps, I will report you. <laughs> Nearly $2 trillion were approved in the recent COVID relief package. This is money that's supposed to help communities rebound. Some school districts across the country are receiving as much as ten to $15,000 per student. National reporter Chris Stewart takes a look at how those school districts are planning to spend the additional money. You won't find many places like Hamtramck, Michigan. As the saying goes in Hamtramck City, it is the world in 2.2 square miles. In recent decades, thousands of immigrants have moved here from places such as Yemen and Bangladesh. In our school system, we have 19 languages overall. Superintendent Jalila Hassan Ahmed says while her students are a beautiful example of diversity, her district faces challenges that shouldn't be found in the United States. Having a school district that's high poverty, a community that's high poverty, comes with a lot of challenges. The average American school is about 44 years old. The building Superintendent Ahmed brought us to is more than twice as old. She says for the last 30 years, this school has used portable trailers as classrooms to ease overcrowding. The trailers started out as temporary, but they've never left because the building, which houses an elementary and middle school, isn't big enough. This is not the perfect environment that anyone would want their children to be in. You know, in a gated one room classroom, this is not America. This is not education in America. 
But her district is expecting a more than $35 million boost through President Biden's COVID relief plan, which breaks down to about $15,000 per student. What does that mean when you hear 15,000 per student here? <laughs> well, as I shared, I wanted to cry. You know, just looking at $35 million, I, I had a mix of emotions. On average, school districts are expecting to see less than $4,000 per student. But the amounts are larger in many school districts with higher rates of students who live in poverty, according to nonprofit education group Chalkbeat. You can't say to school districts to go back to in-person when you know that you failed them, basically. You failed them for, for all these years by not updating the deplorable uh, facilities. Superintendent Ahmed says she can't use the money to buy a new building, but she can use it to update her district schools. Some are so old, they're designated historical landmarks. You note know that this window is our rescue window. And pull this up. Like the windows in middle school teacher Patty Irwin's room. This is the extent of being able to open the window. This building is 100 years old, and it needs massive investment that our community can't support. And it's not that they don't care about education, and it's not that they don't want the best. They don't have the money. It's hard to see that it took this crisis, this pandemic, to help them realize, you know, the deficit that we were in when it came to providing the infrastructure that our students are owed. As we measure the first 100 days of a new administration, Superintendent Ahmed says we need to look to the next 100 past this pandemic, because when it comes to education, there is so much work to be done. I'm strong about the pronoun use of we, educators, politicians, parents, students, everyone needs to be at the table to discuss, reflect on what has occurred, practices, uh, things that maybe we could have done better, and then looking to see how can we better improve the field of education altogether. I'm Chris Stewart reporting. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with more in the loop. Same time, same place. Top stories for news you headed your way right now.